we're going to move on now and talk to Del McFadden, uh, who is the, as I said, um, over at the, the director of the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement, uh, to talk to us about the growth of that agency and its role in violence intervention in D.C. We wouldn't have a problem, Director uh, McFadden, if we had a whole bunch of, uh, you know, uh, Princess Tammy's out here like that. Tommy, uh, right, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> I agree. Exceptional person. Wasn't she fantastic? Yeah, yes, and, yes. and the thing about it is we talk about opportunities. I want to get into what you're going to talk about in a little bit. But we talk about opportunities. But this is a young lady who just used social media to create her own opportunities for herself. I mean, I think that's... Um, that's really interesting. So, because so much we say in our community is that, you know, there are no programs for young people and, and there's nothing for them to do. And all we want to do is uh, get the police involved and what have you. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like your job uh, involves alternatives to, to yes. uh, police intervention. Is that correct? Yes, I'm, I'm the exact opposite of police intervention. And so uh, if you want me to go ahead and get started, I can Please, just go ahead. Yep. Okay, I'm just so the laying the foundation. OK, so the Office of Neighborhood and Safety Engagement came about of legislation from the NEAR Act, Neighborhood Engagement Achieve Results, uh, which the mayor and council, uh, specifically Councilmember McDuffie, uh, put in place uh, 2016. I was selected as the first executive director in 2017, October of 2017. And we are provision 1A of the NEAR Act. And what that states is that we are to engage and support and provide wraparound services, a lot of love and understanding and being empathetic to a group of high-risk individuals, state 50 individuals. But you were here as uh, the growth of the program, we're expanding that uh, support and services to a very specific small group here in the district uh, that we feel need the support and the first fair chance. Um, an opportunity. And so we have our Pathways program where we do cohorts of 25. Uh, next year, we'll have six to eight cohorts. Uh, thus far, we touched 117 individuals um, and we have a class that's taking place right now. And so um, we utilize uh, workforce development. Uh, we utilize um, high fidelity wraparound model to support these individuals. And we probably have about five different uh, professionals that support these individuals and their families from RC Reengagement, which is here in the building with us, uh, which is CSOSA, uh, which is DOES. Uh, we pay a stipend of $11. When they get to the second uh, half of the program, they get $14 an hour. Um, they get a path maker, which is a case manager. They get a credible messenger um, who works with them in the community and on weekends and do retreats um, around the holidays when we see an uptick in violence. So our Pathways program is about eight months and a week after they finish the eight weeks of really changing the mindset and uh, building pride and finding out more about themselves and identity and capacity um, and really understanding that they are uh, 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 undervalued assets in our community. Um, and so if you look back at any of our hearings and you hear these guys speak, um, it is always a tearjerker. Uh, because it's very emotional and from where they've grown to be to where they started before uh, coming to the Pathways pro program is just incredible. So we take on that public health approach. Uh, we do this with the community. Uh, we have multiple professionals to work specifically with this population. And that's part of our violence prevention and intervention uh, piece as well. Uh, we also have the violence intervention work, um, which are the violence interrupters. Um, everybody want violence interruption in their community who really has the difficult task of being out there, they say in the trenches when situations take place. Um, but the job is really to prevent um, homicides and shootings um, from happening. And so they're in the community for at least 30 hours a week working with this uh, high risk population, these people full of promise and potential. Um, and they probably have the most consistent, consistent touch specifically with this population. They are a bridge for this population to get the services and supports that they need. Um, so we have our violence intervention work. We have our ONES Leadership Academy where we're in Anacostia School, um, where we work with the high-risk individuals there based on their grades, behavior, and attendance. Uh, for FY22, we're moving to Paul Charter School in H.D. Woodson. Uh, we also have our crime uh, community-based crime reduction program 
in the Woodland and Bonavista Tourist Community, which assist us with crime reduction as well. We have a new program of restorative justice, and we have our family support services, which address support every family that's impacted by homicide here in the district um, and non-fatal uh, situations as well. So we have our hands tied here and we're constantly growing, um, but we, we, we have a strong ability to tell us services, meet people where they are, be empathetic. I know this slogan is corny, uh, but we don't label people. We label boxes around here. And from the janitor to the security guard, we treat every individual that comes through this office with respect and understanding where they come from and the true potential that's in them when a conducive environment that supports their hopes and dreams uh, can, can, can support them. We know that they'll flourish and we've seen it multiple times. So you said a whole lot, which it sounds are. like you it sounds <laughs> like your hands are very full. And uh, so the last thing that you said, because I was about to start early on to say, okay, I'm hearing a lot of government speak here, um, uh, only because I, you know, read and you know we all listen to, um, you know, the way government describes its programs and the pop, as you use the word, the population that it serves and. You know, I, I like the fact that you said that you don't use labels, although we are using labels like population at risk, um, some other things that you said. So, um, I, you know, the city, of course, is up in up in arms. There, there feels as though there's a, a, a violence or gun related crisis that's affecting uh, our communities. And it's not just over here in Wards 7 and 8, but it's all over the city now. We're seeing it everywhere. So can you maybe point to something that you all have done? And, and you say you've been there for four years, but point to something that you've done that you really think has made a difference. When people can say, all right, we wanted this near act, the mayor funded, you all are there. What difference are you making? What difference are you making? Yeah, so there's a lot of difference that we're making here at the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. Uh, this work, this work um, is dear to me. I'm very passionate about it. And I've been doing it for over 23, 24 years, uh, working in these communities uh, with uh, people of promise um, who just need the opportunity to do better um, and need to transition from where they are to the middle class, uh, to put it uh, plainly. Um, so out of the 117 individuals, we have a class that's taking place right now a very promising group of individuals. Um, we touched 117 individuals. And let me and back you, up. When you say individuals, are you talking about males and females? Are you talking, talking about, about males? Young males from the males. age of 20 to 35, okay. most most involved in what's happening here in the city. And how do so, how do they get into the? How do you identify them? How do they get so, into the program? So we identify individuals. Uh, they're referred. So they referred uh, through CSOSA. Um, these are individuals that's on CSOSA's maximum and intensive list of uh, individuals that they're young folks that they're working with 20 to 35. So they're and already that, in the system some kind of way. It's not like you've, you know, some some young people on a corner said, look, I'm tired of this. Uh, there's a program over there. I want to get involved. These you know, are this, these are young people who are already um, attached to the system some way. Yes, that's exactly what the NEAR Act uh, states oh, to okay, support okay. those individuals. Um, that's already in the system, um, high risk of participating in violence or being victims of violence. In order to get into the Pathways program, um, you have to have a, a, a charge of some type of gun involvement, uh, mm -hmm. multiple, multiple arrests, unsuccessful completion of probation, unemployed or a victim of violence. So oh. we're very specific. That's uh, a tough group program. right there. Yeah. Yes, it is. It mm -hmm. is not easy. Although we make it look easy, it is not easy. And so you ask, you've asked you asked a, a very simple question. How do we know that is working and what are we doing to uh, reduce the uh, violence that's happening here in the district? Of course, we can't count how many situations we prevented, um, but I can tell you out of the 117 individuals, we have additional 20 here today. Um, out of the 117 individuals, we have 47 young men, people of promise, that have been working for six months or better and full-time jobs, ranging ranging from salaries from forty thousand dollars to eighty thousand dollars. Wow! And, and that within itself is a huge um, uh, uh, accomplishment because you know, with dealing with uh, young men who 
come from the various backgrounds and come into a classroom setting for eight weeks and then working uh, uh, strongly with DOES for subsidized employment. It is not easy. Um, and the goal of this program is like the, the Ford uh, motor plant. Uh, it's a conveyor belt. Individuals come in, we want to get them all the tools and wraparound services they need to be successful. So we want to get them an ID first because mm -hmm. you can't work without identification. Uh, uh, we want to get wraparound service that support uh, mental health well-being. So we have professionals here to work on uh, cognitive behavior therapy with these individuals, with these uh, young men. Uh, we also have Aussie, the superintendent of state of education, to work on G their GED. We also can assist with them with getting a CDL and anything that they want to get into as far as, as a apprenticeship. We, we would support them in doing just that. Um, and provide the resources. I, I, I must say the mayor, the mayor has supported this office um, just to give you an idea what that support looked like. We started in 2017 with 14 staff and $2.4 million. For 2021, we uh, were at $10.3 million. And for FY22, we'll be at $28.1 million, which we just got additional $2.8 million yesterday. So we'll be over $30 million, um, at least 12 to 13 million. When you talk about community, um, you said I was using uh, government talk, but when you talk about community, that 12, $13 million is going back into the community All right. because we know that's, that's where the solutions are. It's in the community. Uh, government can't do this alone. Um, you know, we're here, we have responsibilities. We're charged with the responsibility of doing the job. Uh, we're passionate about it. But we're talking about uh, folks that reside in community 24 hours a day um, and they, you know, don't care about uh, small decreases in, in violence. They know what they see when they look out their front window. Um, and so that's very important to us to be able to impact uh, those situations and support our communities as much as possible. You've been out here a long time and, and I, I hear your passion. I really appreciate it. What what are you hearing uh, um, from these young men about what I mean, is it anything new about what has gotten them into the positions that they're in that now cause them to have to come to you? I mean, what is it that we need to do differently as residents in of the District of Columbia to, to you know, maybe to prevent some of this? What, what are they telling you? Yeah, so I'll, I'll get into that. That's that's an excellent question. Um, I just wanted to touch back a little bit, bit um, as far as outcomes again. In 2019 and 2020, we did see a decrease in violence in our priority communities. We have 21 prior, priority communities across the district. We work with three contractors to do that work. They respond to these situations. They have triage meetings within 24 hours, and they go to both communities to mitigate those situations. So in 20, 2020, when we saw an increase nationally, and in the district, we did see some uh, decreases in violence in our priority neighborhoods. In 2019, we saw a significant reduction in two communities where we were able to get a mediation, 40% reduction in two of those neighborhoods. In, Are you uh, able to, to name those neighborhoods? Yeah, Historic Anacostia. Okay. Yeah, we saw a 40% uh, reduction in violence in that community. And that's because of the medi mediations. Um, to go, so yesterday, um, I'm glad you asked that question. Yesterday, I love going into the classroom with the Pathways guys. Um, it keeps you relevant. Um, no matter what you think, it, it keeps you up to date on their struggles. Um, and it, one of the uh, participants um, stated that he's, he's excited about the opportunity and what he had thus far here in the Office of Neighborhood Safety Engagement. However, he has to go back to a war zone. And so I love the conversations because this is a living body of work. And mm -hmm. so nothing is, is, is set in stone. That feedback is critical for the success of this program. And so there's some things that we're already working on when it comes to housing. Um, you know, you change the mindset of the individual, but if you don't uh, provide that support and opportunities for those who they uh, are, their friends in the community or their paramours, uh, their thinking can change, but the thinking in the community stays the same. Um, and that plays a role um, and jeopardize their success. 
Mm -hmm. um, we, we have a lot of young men um, and what we tell them is now that you make this change, every challenge possible is going to come your way because you're trying to change and do something positive. So true. Yeah, we had a retreat. We had a retreat um, two weeks ago and a young man uh, was able to get a job at DPW. He stated when he went back to the community, unfortunately, the community stated that you believe you're better than everyone else. Um, and even went further than that as far as, uh, you know, trying to get the young man not working. So we have to be mindful of these situations, but the only way we get that feedback is from the young men that we work with. And in their environment, what we have to under, uh, understand uh, where we are as far as achievements, employment, education, our lens of the universe is different from an individual who feels hopeless, feels voiceless, and don't see opportunities or caring adults providing the instruction and the direction that they feel they need. Um, and I hear this time and time again when I speak to young men here in the District of Columbia. They really feel like no one is fighting for them. They feel like they're out here alone and they have to do what they need to do to survive. Um, and that leads me to having legitimate opportunities. My, my number one goal in my job is to get individuals to the larger society um, and have legitimate opportunities. Um, and that brings to mind, what are we gonna replace um, if we're asking individuals to stop certain behaviors and stop participating um, in certain activities in our community? We have to be swift in replacing those things that they're so used to and what's the norm for them. And so if an individual comes through, a participant comes through the Pathways program and they're ready because this is not a workforce development program. Our job is to stop uh, their uh, to stop them from coming in contact with the court system. Right. Recidivism. Right. We want to reduce recidivism. We want to eliminate it um, because we know that that's just a downward spiral as they continue to come in contact with the court system. But if a young person comes through here and, and identify through their individual development plan. I want a job. I need a job. I'm ready to take on the opportunity. This is a hand up, not a handout. Uh, we're very different from when we started. And so, uh, and we have a, a young man who's very successful uh, in their jobs at DPW and other government agencies. Um, and so-, so it, uh, I'm sorry, I hate to, hate to cut you off, but yeah, is it yeah. just the government agencies? Is the pri private sector involved at, uh, at all in helping I'm, to promote I'm glad you uh, asked provide that question. opportunities? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that question. We have a scooter company, uh, Dan Whiston, uh, who is the advocate for the spin uh, company here, which is a scooter company, uh, hit us periodically to ask for individuals that they can employ. Uh, they also work with C. Sosa as well. So, and um, I don't know how I got this far without talking about director uh, Holly Hopper. She's working right now um, with a group that says uh, jobs, not guns. Right. And that whole effort is to support uh, this uh, population with employment in the private sector. But we have, uh, as far as these young men, we hired three in our office. Uh, we have uh, uh, some that's at the mayor's office of returning citizens some at the mayor's office of communication, um, some at OC office of contract procurement, DPW. Um, and we're going to continue to make those investments as needed. And how has the uh, returning citizen community, have they, have they been um, helpful at all? I know, you know, we've got organizations like um, uh, Alliance of Concerned Men and, and some of the others, uh, but have they been able to, to be instructive in any way or, or supportive in any, in any way? Yeah, I get a, a lot of support. Uh, Courtney Stewart, um, who supports the returning uh, citizens population. Um, I work very closely with um, Director Lamont Curry from the Mayor's Office of Returning Citizens. Um, I speak to Tyrone Parker. Um, and I uh, was at the C Sosa event where they hired five credible messengers yesterday. And so, you know, every everybody was there. Um, we, we have to do this together. I feel like the next 12 months is pivotal. Um, and we have to take advantage of this window to do to do this very important work. But it is tedious. It is difficult. Um, it is depleting at some times, especially when we lose a young person who's on their way um, to being the best that they can possibly be. Um, it, 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 it hurts uh, uh, tremendously. 
I, I agree. And, and that, uh, because we're running out of time, but I guess the last question I want to ask, I talked about a little bit earlier, how can the rest of the community, what, what role can, can just everyday residents play uh, in, in addressing this violence epidemic that we have right now and the support which you all are doing? Yeah, I think definitely reaching out to, to this office. Uh, we do have uh, work that's going on to empower, to assist in empowering the community and putting together a plan to assist in violence reduction, whether that be a, a neighborhood plan, looking at the environmental issues or other issues and what government agencies that we need to bring to the table. Um, and I work very closely with Jasmine Banab in the mayor's office to make that happen and Julia uh, Irving to make that happen. So looking at the environmental issues, calling 311. Also, if there's young men, we can't be afraid of these young men. Of course, your approach um, ha has to be a certain way and respectful, of course. But if there's young people in the community or, or people in the community that need help, uh, you can contact this office to reach out to them. If they're not a candidate uh, for Pathways, we can see what other support that they may need. Uh, okay. there, are there are multiple things that we're rolling out for FY22 around mental health, around healing circles, around housing, around employment, uh, working with the deputy mayor. We now have 110 or 111 jobs with DPW. So we're, 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 we know that this is an urgent matter, but we know that we cannot do it alone. If anyone thought this office was going to reduce uh, the homicides here in the district alone, sadly mistaken. It takes uh, a whole of government and it takes the community to play a strong role in supporting these young men um, who I feel uh, need the environment that's conducive to their growth. And we don't just want them to be able to duck a bullet and survive. We want them to thrive in our community. Exactly. Right. Uh, Director McFadden, I really appreciate you taking this time uh, with us today. We want to put up on the screen before we let you go how uh, folks can contact your office. What, what would be the uh, best way to contact you all? Yeah, they can contact, they can go to our website at ones.dc.gov. Um, all the information is there. On Say that again, ones. Ones, dot -E .gov. -E. All of our information is there. Um, if you have employment opportunities for these young men, if you want to donate to something specific uh, here in the office, um, if you have workforce development training, um, we have a, we have a full barbershop here and a recording studio because those are things that these young men are interested in. But we are looking for a, th a third career track and it may be solar. Um, I'm having conversations with multiple people about what that can be. It may be carpentry, but we want to be able to provide the best opportunity to a group of uh, individuals, young men that I feel uh, uh, who would uh, thrive if they had the right conditions and support with caring, loving adults. Um, and the resources are so important. Like I stated, we'll be over $30 million for this work. So that gives us a lot to bring quality people uh, to the table and do what we need to do as a government agency here in the District of Columbia. Well, I, I'm, I uh, celebrate the mayor and, and you and your office. Uh, I, you got the appeal out. We want to make sure that uh, you are successful. We want to talk about those successes at the same time that we're having to report these other stories, but the yeah. successes are ones that we cannot overlook. So thank you so very much for being thank with you. us today. And uh, we definitely want to have you back. If you've got another uh, graduation ceremony or something, we want, we, we want to help celebrate. So I'll call us. I'll definitely <laughs> let you know when that promotional ceremony <laughs> takes place so you can be a part of that. Wonderful. Looking forward to it. So we're going to put the uh, uh, website up again. And uh, make sure you check out uh, ones.dc.gov and see how we all as a community can become the village to make a difference that we're looking for. So thank you so very much, thank Director you. McFadden. Thank you. You too.